Good morning. I would like to welcome you all to the sixth annual International Humanitarian Dialogues. This, of course, is a great pleasure for me for the first time being able to stand down before you in this capacity as president of the Robert H. Jackson Center. And so we welcome you all. It is a pleasure for the Jackson Center to host this event at this wonderful institution. And in a moment, the president of the Chautauqua Institution will welcome you. But we are looking forward to a wonderful program this year. Actually, a program that's very, very special to me because this program is looking back at the, first, at the 10 years of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. The reason it's very, very special to me that of those 10 years, I was with the Special Court for Sierra Leone nine and a half years. And so that makes this a very, very special, a very, very special welcome to me joining the Jackson Center and being able to host this great event. And so first, I would like very much to start off introducing our special guests to you all, sitting right here in this front row. And, and you know, it seems when I was here in a, another capacity in past years, the front row had fewer people in it. And so to almost fill the front row at this event with prosecutors and former prosecutors is truly a wonderful experience. And so let me start out with Bill Smith, representing the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Eckhart Witkoff, representing the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. We have Ambassador Stephen Rapp, the third prosecutor for the Special Court for Sierra Leone. <laughs> Sir Desmond De Silva, the second prosecutor for the Special Court for Sierra Leone. <laughs> Brenda Hollis, and most recently my former boss, the current prosecutor for the Special Court for Sierra Leone. And I'm going to skip one for just a minute so I get all the Sierra Leone ones together. We have David Crane, our chair, chairman of the board at the Robert H. Jackson Center, and the first prosecutor for the Special Court for Sierra Leone. We have Hassan Jallo, the prosecutor for the International Tribunal for, the, for Rwanda. We have the newly appointed prosecutor to the International Criminal Court, which, by the way, is not her first trip to, the, to these dialogues. I think she's been to almost all of them, five. This is her fifth trip to these dialogues. But we have Fatou Ben Souta. And last, but certainly not least by any means, in the first of the modern tribunals, not the first prosecutor, but representing the first tribunal, we have Serge Bramitz from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Okay, I will turn it over to Tom Becker for a few opening remarks. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Thank, you, <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Welcome to all of you to the prosecutors who are here. It's an honor to have you on these grounds. Uh, to my friend Greg Peterson, congratulations on finding a successor. Uh, and good luck, Jim. Uh, there's a large shoes for you to, uh, to assume. I guess I, I have a couple of messages for you. Last, last night we tapped a gavel three times and uh, declared the conclusion of the 2012 Chautauqua season. For a period of, of nine weeks, these grounds in this fairly isolated place of western New York devotes itself to a series of considerations about where we are in the human condition, about assessing that condition, about interpreting our own relationship to that and our own responsibilities for that. We dedicate ourselves at the beginning. We close that session. It's quite ceremonial. In a sense, it says that on these grounds, uh, purposes are in fact dedicated and there is here an opportunity for people to open their minds and their hearts and their spirits 
um, to challenging internal assumptions, to confronting the realities of the world we have before us, and again, to really find a personal way in which one must uh, change, alter one's opinion, and behave differently in accordance with that information. That's been going on here since 1874 on these grounds. You good people know what it is to see grounds that have been consecrated in other less positive ways, and you know what it feels like to be on those grounds, to think about the, the legacy of violence and, and genocide and other sorts of behavior. I am uh, very proud of the fact that you're gathering to think about your work in a place that is dedicated to the absolute other side of all of that, the seeking the best among us, uh, holding ourselves to a higher standard. We admire very much the work of the Jackson Center and, the, and what it does all year. This particular conference is entirely satisfying uh, in terms of its presence at this place. So I welcome you and I, I hope that you find over the next uh, days of your work here a real sense of the Chautauqua experience and that I hope that it both opens your mind, renews your spirit, and sends you away more invigorated than ever. Thank you for being at Chautauqua. Okay, before we move into our first program of the morning, a few very, very short administrative announcements. First, probably the most important one, there is only one restroom in this building, but we do have across, right across the way at the Lene Hall our additional restroom facilities. So, um, Those of you who are not staying at the hotel but are going to join us for lunch, it's very, very important that at the first break you see Carol Drake or Jennifer Champ, who will be right outside here at the table, and let them know that you're coming to lunch so, we, and so that we have enough food for everybody. We have a wonderful program, and so we would very much invite you to lunch, but we do need to know you're coming for those not staying at the hotel. If you're staying in the hotel, we've got you taken care of. Uh, I am very, very pleased to announce that for the first time this year, we think the technology has all come together and that these sessions here in Fletcher Hall are being streamed over the internet. And I think we've tried to get the web address out and we can certainly give that to you if you want to get the word to anybody. But uh, they are being streamed. We hope they're being streamed over the internet. The sessions here at Fletcher Hall. And finally, just a reminder, if you have a cell phone, please put it on quiet. Thank you. Uh, okay. First, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our first two presenters this morning for an award for an essay contest and a little bit about an exciting program going on. And uh, I would like to introduce and bring down, please, Andrew Beiter. Where's Drew? There, you see right here up front. And Emily Krauss. There we are. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Drew is probably most importantly a social studies teacher in the eighth grade in Springville Middle School. And that's probably most importantly his work. But Drew is involved in several other very, very exciting programs. And I will just name two of those. One is he's the founder and director of the Summer Institute for Human Rights and Genocide Studies in Buffalo. The second thing that I want to just say about Drew is that Drew and a colleague, Joe Carr, are actively involved in an educational initiative on the part of the Robert H. Jackson Center. And this initiative is working very, very hard to bring Robert H. Jackson into middle school curriculum and to make Robert H. Jackson and the things that he has done known. We're starting out on a regional level, and very, very soon we hope to go to a national level and to some national programs on Robert H. Jackson. And so Drew is running, Drew and his colleague Joe are leading that initiative, and it's off to a wonderful start, and we'd be glad to discuss more of, you, more of that with you if you have any questions. Emily, it is great to have Emily here, and Emily is the Editor-in-Chief of Impunity Watch. And so I will turn it over to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. 
And uh, good morning to everyone and, and to our honored guests. Uh, it's our privilege to be here with you uh, to celebrate the legacy of Robert Jackson and his spirit in the world today. Um, a teacher is a reflection of, of their students, and I'm here today with uh, roughly a third of our Summer Institute class uh, from this year. It's the fifth year of the program designed to give high schoolers intensive human rights and genocide prevention education. It's one of maybe two such programs in North America uh, to which we're thrilled about and that the Jackson Center was a founding sponsor of. Simply put, our students, and if our students could stand up in the back, to the prosecutors in the front row. Um, to the prosecutors in the front row, uh, these are your cosmic grandchildren. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, your legacy is in good hands. And uh, you'll hear more about that when we talk about I Am Syria in a moment. So uh, working with Impunity Watch, uh, we are proud to sponsor uh, an essay contest on human rights now for the third year, to which Emily now is going to describe. So, thank you. Good morning and welcome. I'm Emily Krauss, as Drew mentioned. I am the, a third year law student at Syracuse University College of Law and the editor in chief of Impunity Watch Law Journal. Um, I, along with the executive board of Impunity Watch, which are sitting a few rows up, um, are thrilled to be here and very honored. Uh, I trust that many of you have heard about the work we do at Impunity Watch from Professor David Crane, but for those of you who have not, uh, please allow me to tell you a little bit about what we do. Impunity Watch is an interactive website that operates as both a law review and a news reporting website. Um, our journal was created through the efforts of a dedicated group of students and Professor David Crane uh, in 2007. Impunity Watch is now comprised of over 40 active law students, of news reporters, and associate editors. The goal of our web-based presence is to immediately alert the world to impunity issues as they arise and to provide open access to thoughtful, cutting-edge academic debate about these issues. We work to provide unbiased, objective reporting on impunity issues throughout the world and aim to expose and examine human rights and impunity issues from a grassroots and academic perspective. We collaborate with institutions to further our mission and one of these very important collaborations is with Andrew Biter and the Summer Institute uh, for Human Rights and Genocide Studies in Buffalo. Our relationship helps to foster the next generation of globally conscious and human rights focused thinkers and actors. Um, lastly, along with Andrew and the Summer Institute, uh, we aim to inspire men, young men and women to make a difference in the world. And that was the basis for what our essay contest was about. We wanted to find a young thinker, someone who had embodied our mission in their essay, and we have found that. Great. Our winner this year is Abby, Abigail Cordero, a sophomore at Immaculata High School here in Buffalo. Abby, your essay was, was amazing, and for the prosecutors, I'll be on the Impunity Watch website shortly as our prior winners. So on behalf of all of us here, Abby, we're so proud of you, and we hope this is a springboard for a, a wonderful career in human rights. Emily, thank you. Um, the Holocaust survivor Gerda Klein, who is an adopted Buffalonian, in, in her book All About My Life said, uh, I wrote it not for the current generation, but for the eyes of a time that I will not see. It's in that spirit that the essay contest was started in the Summer Institute. And for the prosecutors, uh, I'd like to show, tell you for the next couple of minutes about a project that talks about those eyes of a time that none of us will see. But the good news is that those eyes are starting to work right now and doing great things. Early this summer, our staff, interns, and students worked with David Crane to create, organize, and spearhead a worldwide movement on behalf of the people of Syria. Recognizing that the crisis there is a threat to freedom everywhere, 
Our group of talented college interns has created a, a website, social media presence, and video to encourage people around the world to stand up in solidarity with our Syrian brothers and sisters. Called IamSyria.org, the campaign asks its viewer to simply hold up a sign that says I am Syria, take a picture, hold it, post it on our Facebook page, and share it with the world. For the next couple of moments, we'd like to play the campaign's promotional video for you, then after, provide some ways that you can get involved today here at the Law Dialogues. So if our, our uh, AV guys could cue the video, it'll be showing on this screen. Within the world community, our lives are all interconnected. When the freedom of one human being is threatened, everyone's freedom is affected. This is especially true today in the country of Syria. For 40 long years, the tyrannical Al-Assad family has been ruling the Syrian people with an iron fist. In 2011, frustrated young civilians took to the streets to protest his harsh dictatorial rule. Their anti-government graffiti sent a powerful message of resistance to the Syrian regime. This brave activism speaks volumes about the Syrian people's desire for freedom, their desire for hope, their desire to be heard, and most importantly, their desire for change in a country they call home. As we see them suffer, we watch with sympathetic eyes, understanding their misery, connecting us as citizens of our world. For when tyranny affects one person, it affects all of us. We are Syria. Despite the thousands of miles that separate us, here's what you can do to help. First, like IamSyria.org on Facebook to keep up with events happening in Syria and show support for individuals like you. Next, Simply grab a camera and record yourself saying, I am Syria. I am Syria. And it's Huria. We, we are Syria. Then upload your video to Facebook or YouTube and share it with us. The instructions are on our webpage at www.iamsyria.org. Our mission is to let Syrians know that they are neither alone nor neglected. No. I am Syria. We are Syria. Syria. I am Syria. Together, we can join our Syrian brothers and sisters to stand up against the inequality they are facing. I'm Mike. I'm Lara. We, we are, are Syria. Syria. We are Syria. I am Syria. Alita Black from Arlington, Virginia, and I am Syria. I am Syria. I am Syria. And that's what we I am Syria. We are Syria. For in reality, I am Syria. Anna, Surya, we are Syria. The Tunisian man that you saw in front of Niagara Falls is named Jamel Bataib, and he's widely credited for being the Facebooker that started the uprising in Tunisia, or that fueled it, uh, to which he was recognized by President Obama in the Oval Office, and he was one of our speakers. So Jamel and his friends are credited for start of the Arab Spring. Our students here in Buffalo will hopefully uh, push it even further. So for our prosecutors, how this connects to you, for the past five years, you've given our kids the opportunity to be here with you. And with that, that investment is starting to pay dividends. So for all of you, we'll have a booth out outside of Fletcher here and at the Anthenaeum where you can take a picture We'll upload it to the Facebook page. We have paint if you want to uh, paint your, your hands. It's quickly washable, uh, I think. Uh, we have t-shirts for sale uh, for a, a modest price. And uh, on behalf of all of us and the great teachers I work with and the folks at the Jackson Center, thank you, David, for the privilege of being here. And uh, we are Syria. Thank you. To introduce our keynote speaker is someone who needs no introduction, so I'll just ask Professor David Crane to come forward. Well,
Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to see you here. It's just always inspiring every single year to see friends, colleagues, uh, my friends and colleagues from the various tribunals and courts uh, to come together here and really, truly, as Tom Becker says, this very special, special place uh, to think, to dialogue, to relax. And as someone said last night, I believe our good friend Sharif Bassioni, who was honored with the Joshua Heinz Award for Humanitarian Service, uh, a very special award, uh, it's a place where we can realize that we're not alone ourselves. It gets a little lonely when you're a chief prosecutor, making decisions that are changing the lives of, and potentially putting lives of human beings in jeopardy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But to be able to come together here and to see my friends and colleagues and to, to chat and to, uh, and to relax and talk about with our other distinguished guests uh, from around the world, distinguished ac academics uh, as well as policymakers and diplomats. Uh, what you have here this morning are the creators of the first hybrid international war crimes tribunal, the special court for Sierra Leone. Not just the four prosecutors, but you have registrars, judges, you have uh, uh, the diplomats who literally wrote the statute uh, who are present today and will be walking the halls and be dialoguing throughout the day in panels, on porch sessions, uh, what have you. And we welcome you, everybody in this room, students and Chautauquans and friends of the Jackson Center, to continue uh, to be with us for the next two days to, uh, to listen, to talk, uh, and discuss uh, the idea of the rule of law is more powerful uh, than the rule of the gun. And speaking of which, we're here to introduce uh, someone also who needs no introduction, but someone who, for those of you who are not in this business, uh, need to understand the importance of uh, the presence of Ambassador Hans Carell. Uh, someone who has been there almost at the very beginning. We were walking over uh, this morning after breakfast, and I just said, Hans, looking back, you know, it, this business, this modern international criminal law business, has only been around for 18 years. Uh, you know, I remember introducing Hans Carell. I was the moderator of a panel celebrating the 50th anniversary of Nuremberg at the Judge Advocate General School at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And it's the first time where I met you, along with our dear departed friend, uh, Henry King. And we were looking at and discussing the legacy of Nuremberg. And this is in 1994, 95, and little did we know all of this was still, in large measure, ahead of us. Just think of how far we have come. And so this morning, Ambassador Hans Carell, uh, who was the UN legal counsel uh, of the United Nations from 1994 to 2004, uh, he has been involved in the establishment, oh, this is important, think of this, he's been involved in the establishment of all of the existing international war crimes tribunal except in Lebanon. After his law degree in Uppsala University in 1962, he served in different courts of Sweden and was appointed Judge of Appeal in 1980. In 1972 to 1984, he served in the Ministry of Justice the last three years as Chief Legal Officer. He was Ambassador and Head of the Legal Department of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, 1984 to 1994. Since his retirement, it would take me about an hour to describe what you were doing. This is a man who did not retire and is involved in all of the major issues related to international criminal law, the environment, he's doing some important work in the Arctic, what have you. Let me introduce you to my friend, our friend, Ambassador Hans Karel. Distinguished colleagues and friends, let me first thank the sponsors of this, the sixth International Humanitarian Law Dialogues, for inviting me to address you. This is the first time that I participate in the dialogues here in Chautauqua. I accepted the invitation with great pleasure because I knew that I would meet many friends from the years in which I was deeply involved in participating in establishing effective administration of international criminal justice. My first experience of this work was as a war crimes rapporteur 
in the former Yugoslavia, 92-93. My colleagues and I presented the first proposal for the tribunal that eventually became the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. My last function as the legal counsel of the United Nations was in March 2004, when I represented UN Secretary General Kofi Annan at the inauguration of the courthouse for the special court for Sierra Leone in Freetown. I've been asked to address the topic, reflections on international criminal law over the last 10 years. It's actually slightly broader than the title for the dialogues this year. I will do this in four main points. Number one, salient features in the development over the last few years. Number two, the Rome Statute and the obligations of state. Number three, the role of the Security Council. And number four, crime prevention and protection of human rights. Before embarking on this exercise, I must make clear in particular, when I see all the expertise present in the room, including persons with day-to-day -day experience of serving in different capacities in these international institutions, that my experience is somewhat different. Yes, I have served on the bench for some 10 years at the national level, but I have not served in international courts. All my activities relating to the institutions that we are to discuss here have been focused on their establishment and administration. Therefore, I do not have the same kind of experience that most of the participants in this year's dialogues have. Furthermore, after my retirement from the UN and from public service in my own native Sweden in 2004, I've been deeply involved in so many other matters that I have not been able to follow in detail the case law that has developed in the international criminal courts over these years. My focus on international criminal justice has mainly been on the International Criminal Court and the situation in Kenya. The simple reason for this is that since February 2008, I have been the legal advisor to former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan and the other members of the panel of eminent African personalities engaged in the Kenya National Dialogue and reconciliation. The main focus of my work in later years has been on protection of human rights and the importance of establishing the rule of law both at the national and the international level. These elements are therefore important points of departure for my presentation today. You will also notice that my presentation will be very personal. Ladies and gentlemen, with these provisos, let's now focus on the first main point, salient features in the development over the last few years. When the agreement on the Special Court for Sierra Leone was signed in Freetown on the 60th of January 2002, the Yugoslav and the Rwanda tribunals had been in operation for almost 10 years. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court was to enter into force on the 1st of July 2002. And on the 8th of February 2002, Secretary General Kofi Annan was to withdraw from the negotiations with Cambodia on the establishment of what eventually became the extraordinary chambers uh, in the, of the criminal courts in Cambodia. While the Security Council had deemed it appropriate to establish the Yugoslav and the Rwanda tribunals, they were not comfortable with the idea of establishing yet another tribunal of this nature in Sierra Leone. An important difference between the two tribunals established by the Council and the Special Court is that states have different obligations. With respect to the two tribunals established by the Council, states are bound by resolutions adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. The same obligations do not flow from the agreement between the UN and Sierra Leone. I, for one, had hoped, of course, that the Council would adopt a resolution creating Chapter 7 obligations to cooperate with the Special Court once the agreement was concluded, but this did not materialize. The negotiations between the UN and Sierra Leone were conducted on the basis of Security Council Resolution 1315 of August 2000. 
In paragraph 8C of that resolution, the Council had requested the Secretary-General to include recommendations on the, as it is said, the amount of voluntary contributions as appropriate of funds, equipment and services to the Special Court, including through the offer of experts personnel that may be needed from states into governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations." End of quote. Within the Secretariat, we concluded that the intention of the Council was that the Special Court should be financed from voluntary contributions from UN member states. The Secretary General's view was that the only realistic solution was financing through assessed contributions, and he provided reasons for this opinion. I have in another context expressed regret that we did not advise the Secretary General to include in his report yet another argument in favor of assessed contributions, namely the constitutional argument. One should make a comparison with funding of courts at the national level. If national courts were funded by different donors and not from taxes or similar official revenues, what credibility would they have? This reasoning should, in my view, actually be applied also at the international level. In a more general perspective, there has, of course, been a tremendous development in the field of international criminal law over the last few years. There is no point in giving an account of the records of the existing international criminal tribunals to the present audience. Suffice it to say, or let us say, that both the ICTY and the ICTR are being wound up in accordance with plans and that the residual mechanism has been set up to manage the remaining issues. One mechanism is operational as of 1st of July this year in Arusha for the purpose of looking after the Rwanda elements and another branch will be established in The Hague on the 1st of July next year to look after the items from that tribunal. And uh, the Council will keep an eye on this and they will review this in 2016 for the first time. But looking at the courts, I I think it's fair to say that the record of these two tribunals is impressive. In particular, the trial and conviction of high-level perpetrators has made an important mark in the history of international criminal law. The same could be said about the Special Court of Sierra Leone. The most significant case, of course, here is the trial of Charles Taylor. If anyone had suggested to me when I signed the agreement on the 60th of January 2002, on behalf of the United Nations, with then Minister of Justice, Solomon Member Reva, that Charles Taylor would stand trial before this court. I would not have believed that. The extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia is a complex issue. I'm sure that you understand that my position is somewhat delicate here. While others may be free to express their views about this process, I'm still bound by the rules of discretion that apply to international civil servants. It also goes without saying that I must support the extraordinary chambers and hope that their work will benefit the people of Cambodia and have great respect for those who are doing their best serving the chambers in the present circumstances. Great respect for their work. So much could be said, though, that I was extremely concerned at the development of the negotiations that led, that led to the establishment of these chambers. There is no similarity with those negotiations in the negotiations with Sierra Leone. In particular, I was concerned about some of the features that appear in the final agreement. The reason is partly that when the UN is negotiating, there are many involved behind the scenes. This was certainly the case also here. There were several states that took a keen interest in these negotiations. Now, many of these persons had no courtroom experience. And in my view, this is the reason that the UN Secretariat was obliged to accept features that has led to the difficulties that now exist. I've actually suggested to the Secretary General that he should open the UN records from the negotiations to the public. I have no idea when this will happen or if it will happen soon. But one day, the information will be made public. The efforts by the UN delegation 
to arrive at the result that respected international standards for the conduct of proceedings in criminal cases will then be apparent. Let me just say that as a professional judge, I was extremely concerned when the UN Secretariat was forced back to the negotiation table by the UN General Assembly in December 2002. In some respects, our hands were tied. Now, some of the things I warned against have actually occurred. I'm sure that one day, even people without courtroom experience will understand that the solution chosen for the special for the extraordinary chambers should not be used as a model for any future effort of this nature. The UN hallmark should not be given to institutions over which the organization does not have full administrative control. The International Criminal Court can now look back on 10 years of activity. It is obvious that establishing an institution of this nature requires careful considerations and a considerable start-up phase. I can agree with the present UN Legal Counsel, Patricia O'Brien, when she says, I quote, for several decades, the voices of victims who suffered unimaginable atrocities went unheard as international communities struggled to build upon the legacy of the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals. The tide has finally turned. Today, those responsible for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other gross violations of international humanitarian and human rights law are being held accountable. Heads of state and senior officials can no longer hide from justice." End of quote. However, there is still a long way to go, and I must confess that I'm somewhat concerned that the record so far by the International Criminal Court is rather meager, at least in comparison with the achievements of the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals and the Special Court for Sierra Leone during a similar period of time. There could be several reasons for this. In particular, the degree of willingness of states to cooperate effectively with the court. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the second main point, the Rome Statute and the obligation of states. Let me first focus on the principle of complementarity. There are presently two, 121 states' parties to the statute. The first obligation is to see to it that the statute is properly implemented at the national level. In my view, this is one of the most important contributions that the Rome Statute makes in the field of criminal justice. In discussing this question at a conference in The Hague already back in 2000, I suggested that perhaps the most important factor in fostering acceptability of the ICC is the fact that the court was not created as a replacement to the national jurisdictions emanating from the principles on which this jurisdiction is based, but rather as a complement. This complementarity principle became a key element in the negotiations in Rome. The court may determine that a case brought before it is admissible if the case is, is being investigated or prosecuted by a state that has jurisdiction over it. However, if the state is unwilling or unable genuinely to carry out the investigation or prosecution, the ICC may decide to deal with the case. From this follows that states have an obligation to carefully examine the national criminal justice system in the process of ratifying the Rome Statute. It is obvious that in many cases it will be necessary to introduce rather elaborate implementation legislation. A natural ingredient in this process should be to see if improvements of a more general nature can be made to the national system based on the common effort in Rome. Hopefully, this will lead to a harmonization of criminal law and criminal procedure in the community of states. I'm not aware exactly how this work has proceeded in the states that have ratified the Rome Statute. However, I have a feeling that much remains to be done here. I say this since I have observed that also my country that has ratified the Rome Statute, in that country work remains to be done in this respect. 
Sweden would normally examine meticulously the need for legislative acts before ratification of international agreements. This work is, however, not yet fully completed with respect to the Rome Statute. Another obligation that falls upon states is that they must see to it that attention is paid to the national, at the national level to the ICC case law in case this case law should, of course, influence also the national justice system. A most important element when we discuss the obligations of states is, of course, the provision in Part 9 of the Rome Statute on international cooperation and judicial assistance. Article 86 of the statute contains a general provision that obliges states to cooperate fully with the ICC in its investigation and prosecution of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. As you are well aware, this provision is followed by a number of detailed rules on the topic. The question is, to what extent do states fulfill their obligations here? There are many present here who are better placed than I am to provide information about this, and perhaps this could be a topic for discussions at the present dialogues. Suffice it to say that criticism is sometimes unjustly voiced against the ICC for not being effective when the criticism should actually be directed against states that do not cooperate. I note in this context a very pertinent remark that ICC prosecutor Fatou Bansouda, who we are happy to see among us here, made to Al Jazeera in July this year in relation to the prosecution of the president of Sudan. This is what she said, quote, the way that ICC has been set up, we do our legal part. We investigate and we request for arrests warrants to issue. This is our part. And if we do have the person brought before the court, we prosecute. But the obligation to arrest, the obligation to execute the warrants of the court are with the state's parties. We've done what we were supposed to do and I think it is up to the state's parties to ensure that Omar al-Bashir is arrested and brought to the court. I think his destiny is with the International Criminal Court. It is not yet time, perhaps, for Bashir, but I believe he will be arrested eventually." End of quote. In this connection, it should also be noted the attitude that has developed within the African Union with respect to cooperating with the ICC. One can fully understand that this discussion takes place in Africa. The situation and cases presently before the ICC are focused on that continent. However, the prosecutor has to go where the evidence leads him or her. This is a common feature in the field of criminal justice. At the same time, there is a genuine problem that flows from the fact that many states, including some of the most powerful ones, are not parties to the Rome Statute, among them, regretfully, the United States of America. Another problem is the tendency by some states to apply double standards when it comes to international criminal justice. I will revert to this question shortly. An interesting example of cooperation with the ICC is the situation in Kenya. You will recall that after the general elections and the presidential election in Kenya in December 2007, there followed a period of extreme violence in the country. Some 1,300 people lost their lives and more than 650,000 people became internally displaced. To make a long story short, a national commission examined the so-called post-election violence and proposed that the special court should be established at the national level to try those suspected of having orchestrated the violence. When a proposal to this effect had been defeated twice in the National Assembly, representatives of the government of Kenya visited the ICC prosecutor to seek assistance. Eventually, this led the prosecutor to seek proprio motu indictment of six persons for crimes against humanity. The pretrial chamber came to the conclusion that the cases against four of these could proceed before the ICC, and these rulings were confirmed by the Appeals Chamber. 
What is striking in this context is the attempt some time ago by the government of Kenya to try to convince the Security Council that they should stay the hand of the prosecutor in accordance with Article 16 of the Rome Statute. Furthermore, the African Union is considering expanding the jurisdiction of the African Court of Justice and Human and People's Rights, and I refer to it as the African Court here, to include international crimes such as genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. A similar extension is also contemplated for the East African Court of Justice. I noted that on the 3rd of May 2012, some 50 African civil society organizations and international organizations with a presence in Africa sent a letter to African justice ministers and attorneys general to share their concern regarding the proposed expansion or jurisdiction of the African Court. Let me quote the following from this letter. African Union members have the primary obligation to investigate and, if there is sufficient evidence, prosecute persons suspected of crimes under international law before their national courts. The ICC already promotes complementarity at the national level. Expanding the African Court's jurisdiction and diluting the work of the current African Court of Human and People's Rights may not only undermine human rights protection, but also divert resources and attention from strengthening the ability and willingness of national authorities to prosecute international crimes. End of quote. I could not agree more. The contemplated extension of jurisdiction is, in my view, utterly troubling. Based on my experience from the bench in criminal cases and my responsibility as the agent of the Swedish government before the European Court of Human Rights for 11 years, my considered opinion is that it would be a disaster to extend the jurisdiction of the African Court in the manner contemplated. A human rights court is a completely different uh, uh, institution from a criminal court, and it must be different from such a court. And I suspect that the similar reasoning could be made with respect to the East African Court of Justice. Another striking feature with respect to the situation in Kenya is that two of the persons indicted before the ICC are candidates for the presidential election scheduled for March 2013. They are now campaigning for themselves as if nothing had happened. The trials are scheduled for April 2013. When Secretary General Hillary Clinton raised this matter during her recent visit to Kenya, she was criticized by some for meddling into the internal affairs of the country. In my view, she was absolutely right in raising these issues. True, there is the important principle of uh, presumption of innocence. This must be emphasized emphatically. However, this is one thing. It is a completely different matter if persons indicted for serious international crimes start campaigning to become the head of state in his or her country. Already common sense gives the answer. It is unthinkable. It is unthinkable that persons suspected of such grave crimes should be accepted as candidates in a presidential election. You don't even have to go to chapter six of the Constitution of Kenya to draw this conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now revert to the responsibility of states and to the specific responsibility that rests with the state's parties to the Rome Statute. Obviously, a proper administration of the ICC is heavily dependent on the support of the Assembly of States Parties. I do not intend to dwell too much on this self-evident requirement. However, I would like to reiterate three concerns that I have expressed in the past. First, that is the question of qualifications of candidates for election to the court. In my view, too much emphasis has been put on the requirement of knowledge of international law. Much more emphasis should be put on courtroom experience. I've actually suggested that if the only intention with a list B for candidates for election to judges to the ICC is to allow persons with no courtroom experience whatsoever to sit on the court, the ASP may be wise to abolish this list. 
Another matter is the question of age. Here, I have suggested that the Assembly of States parties should not elect candidates who pass 70 before their nine-year term expires. A closer look at Annex 3 to the report of the Independent Panel on International Criminal Court Judicial Elections reveals that out of the 96 states parties that provided information about retirement age, 76 states parties, or 80%, have retirement age which is 70 years and below. If it transpires that the ICC consists of judges who are no longer regarded as suitable for service on the bench on their own, in their own countries, there is a clear risk that the ICC will lose respect. My third concern relates to the method of electing judges. In this respect, I have suggested a method where an independent committee of experts should review not only the candidates for election, but also the judges who remain on the court, so as to be able to propose candidates who would be most suitable from the point of view of the composition of the ICC as a whole. Such a measure, method would allow the committee to ex present a so-called clean slate, clean slate, which would be accepted, could be accepted by the Assembly of States parties. Under all circumstances, it is imperative that vote trading and similar unworthy features are abandoned in the election process. The ASB, the Assembly of States parties, should be looking for the very best. In making these proposals, I have emphasized, as I do know emphatically, that they should in no way be understood as criticism of the present judges of the ICC. The subject matter is a systemic question and consequently the sole responsibility of the Assembly of States parties. With the benefit of the experience from the Kenyan cases, the Assembly of States parties may also wish to consider whether the Rome Statute should allow appeal against decisions by the pretrial chamber that the ICC has jurisdiction in a particular case. I know that this statement may come as a bit of a shock, but let me explain. The fact that the Rome Statute allows appeal against such decisions entails a clear risk that the pre-trial phase gets mixed up with the trial phase. A decision of this nature by the pre-trial chamber should be delivered promptly and be as brief as possible. As it is now, the pre-trial chamber may have to spend too much time in formulating its decisions, which have to stay clear of issues that relate to the substantive merits of the case, as opposed to the issue of whether the court has subject matter jurisdiction to consider such questions. If the pretrial chamber finds that the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction in a particular case, I really do not see any reason why this decision should be appealable. Too much focus on the pretrial phase, which in this context actually or basically is an extra check on the prosecutor, risks entailing serious delays in trials before the ICC. I admit it's a complex question, but my strong advice to the Assembly of States parties is that they should look into this question. The third main point, the role of the Security Council, is an obvious issue to discuss. The provision in Article 13b of the Rome Statute allows the Security Council, acting under Chapter 7 of the Charter, to refer to the prosecutor of the ICC a situation in which one or more of these crimes referred to in Article 5 of the Statute appears to have been committed. In my view, this provision in no way prevents the Security Council from establishing new criminal tribunals of the kind that the Yugoslav and the Rwanda tribunals represent. However, the whole idea is, of course, that this should not be necessary when there is a permanent and fully functional court established. But the way in which this provision has been applied so far is somewhat problematic. As is well known, the Council has referred two situations to the ICC prosecutor, the situation in Sudan and the situation in Libya. But the question must be asked why in these situations 
and not in other situations. In my view, the situation in Gaza in 2008 and 2009 would be an obvious case in point. And what about Syria at present? To an objective observer, it would seem that the members of the Security Council, and in particular the permanent five members, do not use the same yardstick when they apply Article 13b to the Rome Statute in different situations. Furthermore, in the two cases where Article 13b has been applied, the resolutions contain the following paragraph. Quote, recognizes that none of the expenses incurred in connection with the referral, including expenses related to investigations or prosecutions in connection with that referral, shall be borne by the United Nations, and that such costs shall be borne by the parties to the Rome Statute and those states that wish to contribute voluntarily." Unquote. I must confess that I didn't believe my eyes when I read this provision for the first time. Surely, in an international society under the rule of law, the organ that makes a decision under Article 13b of the Rome Statute should be prepared to contribute in a reasonable manner to the cost generated by that decision. I refer also to why I just said about financing courts by voluntary contributions in relation to the Special Court of Sierra Leone. One could also discuss the appropriateness of Operative Paragraph 6 in the two resolutions mentioned, namely the provision that exempts national, current or former officials or personnel from states outside the situation area, which is not a party to the Rome Statute from the jurisdiction of the ICC. However, here it is easier to understand the background, provided that any criminal offences by persons falling under the exemption are properly addressed by competent national courts. Furthermore, one would, not, would one not expect the Security Council to follow suit and act in accordance with its own resolutions? If the evidence leads the ICC prosecutor to the level of head of state, would one not expect the Council to support the ICC, including, if need be, by ordering the state in question to deliver the accused to the ICC? One of the lessons from the development over the last few years is, in my view, something that my colleagues and I discussed when we were war crimes rapporteur in the former Yugoslavia back in 1992-93. If persons at this level are suspected of war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide, sooner or later they become a burden to their own country. We have seen this certainly in the former Yugoslavia the same can be expected to happen also elsewhere. I'm fully aware that a reasoning of the kind that I have presented here can be viewed as idealistic and out of touch with realities. But here again I would like to refer to the very firm positions that the organizations of former heads of state and government have taken, the Madrid Club and the Interaction Council of former heads of state and government. In their view, the only way ahead in addressing the challenges mankind faces is through a multilateral solutions within a rules-based international system. This also brings to the forefront the formidable contribution that the members of the Security Council could make to our efforts to establish the rule of law, both at the national and the international level. I can, it cannot be stressed enough how important it is that these states and in particular the five permanent members of the Council take the lead by demonstrating that they bow to the law and in particular to the law that they are set to supervise, the Charter of the United Nations. I will not go further into detail here but refer to my reasoning elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the fourth main point, crime prevention and protection of human rights. International criminal justice should, of course, reflect the classical objective underlying the criminal justice system at the national level, crime prevention, be it individual or general. By bringing individuals to justice for crimes committed, the perpetrators will be prevented from continuing their criminal activity. This is an obvious purpose of the system. However, what the state community should also be vigorously aiming at is general prevention. 
by demonstrating that perpetrators are being investigated and prosecuted, there is a greater chance that humankind can live in peace and security in the future. One should certainly not oversimplify here, but it goes without saying that the moment prominent rulers are brought to justice, other rulers would note this and hopefully adjust their behavior. The connection between crime prevention and protection of human rights is obvious. The first element that comes to mind is the connection here, of course, the fact that those who are brought to justice should be protected by due process and other human rights components that are required in the proper criminal justice system. But what I have in mind here are the human rights of the many thousands around the world who are suffering being abused under rulers. Protection of human rights is a core element in the rule of law. The rule of law must be permeating a society in all its aspects. The connection between criminal justice and other fields of law cannot be overemphasized here. The legal system must be seen as a whole. By way of example, a couple of months ago, the World Congress on Justice, Governance and Law for Environmental Sustainability took place in Rio de Janeiro. This Congress gathered over 200 high-level judges, prosecutors and auditors general, and it preceded the Rio Plus 20 conference. At the end of the Congress, the participant adopted a resolution expressing a resounding support for the rule of law, the necessity for the rule of law in managing also the environment. Since we are now in the United States, I feel obliged to point to the responsibility that falls upon the Western democracies in this respect. If we are to succeed in establishing the rule of law at the national and international levels, these states simply have to set the example. But unfortunately, much remains to be done here. The development in the US over the later years is in my view a source of great concern. The latest newsletter from the American Society of International Law, the president of the society, Donald Donovan, presents a very interesting analysis of the United States relationship to international law. His point of departure is that the United States had long been in the vanguard of the developing system of international law and international dispute resolution. Based on experiences of later years, he puts the question why some segment of the US body politic have become so skeptical to international law. His conclusion is that it is the United States interest now more than ever to promote the rule of law on the international plane as well as to support fair and independent adjudication as a component of the rule of law. An important actor in establishing the rule of law, both nationally and internationally, is the United Nations. The main engineer behind the establishment of the United Nations was the United States of America. Sadly, today, the President of the United States of America does not even dare to refer to the United Nations in its State of the Union addresses. When it comes to criminal law, the same standards must be applied all over the world. According to the New York Times on 14 November 2011, three of the contenders, contenders or one of the political parties' nomination for president came out in favor of authorizing waterboarding in order to extract information. In other words, torture. And what about Guantanamo and the use of drones? And the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, what should she do if it turns out that in a case, in a situation that is before her, it, it turns out that drones have been used and that civilians have been killed? I'm afraid that this question will not be hypothetical for very long. To a great friend of the United States, these are extremely troubling elements. What is needed to remedy the situation in this country, as well as in Europe and in the rest of the world, is education. What people, and in particular politicians, must know is that the rule of law has to apply absolutely to all people at all times. The behavior of the major states, and in particular 
the five permanent members of the Security Council will be a determining factor, if not the determining factor, for the maintenance of international peace and security in the future. Of particular importance is that the Western democracies take the lead here. To conclude, I really hope that you will have a profitable dialogues this year. I wish you interesting, stimulating and constructive dialogues. It is important that the knowledge and the experience that you have gathered over the years, you prosecutors who are present here, can be transferred to a new generation of prosecutors and that you will find a way of organizing this transfer in a appropriate manner. And I know that is, this is on your minds at present. Because if you can do so, you will be able to carry on and hand over a message to coming generation in the service of humankind. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Before I leave the rostrum, could I draw your attention to a publication that was released only a couple of days ago, Rule of Law, a Guide for Politicians. You will find it if you Google those words. Otherwise, you will find it at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute in Lund or the Hague Institute of International Organization of Law. This is a product. It's 40 pages long, intentionally so short, based on discussions among former heads of states and government where they said it's important to draw the attention of politicians to the importance of the rule of law. And this is an attempt by the two institutions to produce something that busy politicians have time to read. It could be useful also for others. Thank you. Thank you again. Please, one more time. Thank you. Before we break, it is truly my pleasure to introduce one more prosecutor. H.W. William Kaming was named chief prosecutor in the ministry's case at Nuremberg. And so I wish you all, and please assist me in giving Bill a very, very warm welcome back to the dialogues again this year. It is time for a break, and I would ask that you all be back in your seats promptly at 1040, please, so that we can move on with the next session. Thank you very much.
everybody.